Hi, David Visard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. In this episode of Paratech 10, we're going to look at the power capability of crankshafts. And this is not just the power capability depending on the stroke of the crank for it to increase displacement or decrease it, but on how we can make the crankshaft more effective in our engine. So follow along on that. Before going on though, I would like to make a statement. This statement is to show my appreciation in the first place and to make sure that I've got some kind of disclaimer here to, uh, so that my neutral um, opinion can be um, uh, validated, right? And this, um, what I want to say here is that Tom Lieb at SCAT Enterprises has been a near lifelong friend uh, and has supported my R&D efforts from square one. So I want to say thank you for Tom for that. And uh, also all of you guys out there need to be grateful for this because he has funded tests which otherwise you wouldn't see. The second thing is, is that I use SCAT cranks, not exclusively, but for the majority of my builds. And the reason for that is not that I'm biased uh, because Tom's my friend, but because in the entire time I've been using SCAT cranks, and this is almost from day one, it, from when they opened their doors, I've never broken one, in spite of beating the tar out of them, big nitrous uh, deals and turbo deals and things like this, and never had a problem. Now, that's not to say I haven't had a problem with some other cranks. I mean, I can tell you for a fact um, that I haven't had a problem with car cranks. I haven't had a problem with uh, Cosworth cranks uh, and, and several other brands. But there are brands out there that I have had problems with. You know what they say? If it ain't broke, don't try to fix it. Not sure what ain't means, but I think it's another word for isn't. That said, let's get on with our um, investigation on why we need to have certain things done on our crankshafts to improve them. First, to the drawing board. As probably many of you are aware, at this channel's watched by everybody in uh, skill levels from a rank beginner to top professionals. So, for those pros, please forgive me for spending the time to point out all the obvious uh, dimensions on the uh, rotating assembly. That said, let's go. Number one. That is the center line of the crank to the deck, and that is called the deck height, right? That's important that we get that correct with real relations with all of these dimensions here so that the piston comes either close to or just out of the block when it's rotating right number two that's the crank throw twice that is the crank stroke which is number three right see there's the stroke there so the piston goes top dead center to bottom dead center there as the crank rotates Number four is the rod length. Notice we've got two colors of dimensions here. That's because they refer to different aspects, right? Here's the rod length. That's important because we need to know our rod stroke ratio. This dimension here is the bore, right? The stroke 
there the piston goes up and down plus the bore gives the, this is what we call the swept volume so there's the stroke there's the stroke here's the bore here's the bore this is the swept volume or the cylinder CID right now uh, we are going to deal with at the moment we're going to deal with everything in this area here that's the crankshaft counterweight the throw etc etc right but this all here keep all of this in mind and you'll find that it will come in handy oh i should mention this the pin height that's another important dimension right uh, that's the height of the pin from the center line to the crown of the piston right uh, so the rest of it's pretty obvious right eight is the counterweight seven is the crank pin five is the piston two is the bore one is the deck six is the rod uh, and I think that about covers it here we're going to look at something which is often a great controversy we're going to look at the rod angularity and piston side thrust now the shorter the rod is now here I've greatly exaggerated the pin position here right it's gone from here to down here which is not really practical in that drawing but we can see that when the pistons about halfway down the bore the pressure here translates into a side load here and a downward load the shorter the connecting rod is the higher this side load is so that the more the friction is between the piston and the wall now that's the that is the disadvantage of a short rod. The advantage is that it hangs around bottom dead center longer. So for a given amount of, of uh, a valve closure delay, the piston has moved up the bore less. So it spends more time down here drawing in charge and for a given delay in closing moves up less. So that should increase the volumetric efficiency however we have to decide whether the side load and the volumetric efficiency ab ability of a short rod balance out in our favor very often they don't so normally a longer rod is preferred and there's a sweet spot in the rod length to crank stroke around about for most practical purposes around about 1.6 to about 1.8 right so there we have the uh, situation concerning the rod length now obviously if we put in a stroke or crank we're going to move that piston further up the bore so we need to reconfigure the piston so that the pin is further up and moving the pin up as far as possible will allow us to accommodate the longest rod possible now there's a good and a bad side to this right the longer rod does actually make more horsepower on a small block chevy small block ford but it's small however the longer the rod is the quieter the assembly runs short rods are somewhat prone to more piston slap rod stroke ratio there's the length of the rod here is the stroke of the crank see this is the circle a big end center takes as it goes around so the stroke is this here the rod stroke ratio is a divided into b as i said about for what we're dealing with somewhere about 1.6 to 1.8 seems to be a convenient ratio to have and gives good results now how important is this ratio very important especially on a stroker motor it's easy to get out of hand on this so the thing is is always keep in mind that your rod stroke ratio needs to be between about 1.6 and 1.8 sure things will work outside of that range especially when they're bigger in the two to one ratio but when they start to get to 1.5 or so 
you've really got to pay attention to piston friction. Well, here's our super crank, and I make no apologies for the brand. One, journal, micro polished bearing surfaces. And I'll have a few things to say about polished journals uh, in a while. Two, pendulum counterweights. Notice the crank has been lightened by taking all this material here. Material here contributes very little to the balancing, whereas material out here contributes much more. In fact, you can have a certain weight here that is less than at the journal, and if it's at the right radius, you can balance out the excess mass here with less mass here. This is an attempt to make the crank shaft lighter overall, yet be balanceable. Number three, lightweight journal web. See how it's cut away here quite a bit. Number four, hollow jour rod journal. That makes balancing a lot easier. And of course, it gets rid of a big slug of solid steel. Number five, undercut web. We've talked about that down here. Right, again, that's so that you can get the crank as light as possible, consistent with being able to balance it. Number six. Now, this is a small factor here. A star flywheel flange. It gets rid of about a pound of weight out of the crank, but it has little effect on the dynamics, the rotating inertia of the crank, because it's at such small radius. However, the point I want to make here is it's better to have this done than not, even though the gains are small. When you're racing, you can't afford to leave anything on the table. Hence, the star flywheel flange. Moving on to detail seven. Here, we have a crank streamlined for better windage. Now, it is possible to streamline the crank more than you see there. However, this crank was made for a really high-tech engine, and it is assumed that such high-tech engine is going to be drawing vacuum on the crankcase. The more vacuum that is drawn on the crankcase, the less the aerodynamic qualities of the crankshaft pay off. So, this form here is just a nominal streamlining form for a crankcase which may be pulling 18 to 20 inches of vacuum on it. Now let's go to point eight. That's this here, the polished fillet in the corner of the, uh, the cheek of the crank and the rod journal itself. This is very important. That polish has to be micro level and it, the radius needs to be as large as possible because that is where the crank break. The bigger the radii there, the less likely the crank is going to break from fatigue or any other reason for that matter. I want you to note this hole here. I've heard some people say, why do they bother to put it in? All it does is weaken the journal. Well, no, that's exactly the opposite of what it does. Many years ago, during Rolls-Royce's development of the Merlin engine, they found from considerable research they did on crank strength or strength to weight, that making a hollow journal and putting a radius on it like this actually made the crank have a longer fatigue life. Now, for what it's worth, that nearly six foot long Merlin crank only weighed 128 pounds, and they can handle 3,500 horsepower. Here's another point I want you to note. See how this edge is rounded here? That's to cut windage. Now, on this particular crank, this is a... Um, 
Kali's Dragon Slayer, they've not done many of these mods uh, to keep the price down. And this is, is a steel crank, a 3 and 7 8 stroke. Nice crank, pretty tough. I've used several of them and they've been totally trouble free. If we're going to go further on crank windage, these forms here and on here need to be addressed. Apart from fatigue life, another advantage of drilling out the uh, uh, big end bearing like this, the big end journal, is that it's easier to balance the crank. On a stroker motor, as the stroke goes up, if nothing else changes, then you need more counterweight to balance it out. However, putting a big hole in like this, in a good material, not only strengthens it, but allows the crank to be balanced at a lighter mass. I want you to see how the crank has been formed just here. It is shaped like this so that the crank will miss the bottom of the piston skirt at the bottom of the bore. This is especially a prevalent move on a stroker crank. Also, a lot of metal had to come off here to balance the crank. Notice it was not drilled, right? And we'll get into that later. What I'd like to do here is to get into the details of the experiments I did for Tom at SCAT on the leading edge and trailing edge shapes of the counterweights. Now, up through the 80s, especially the early 80s, this was your standard shape. Crank's going to be turning this way. This was a typical shape of the, the face of the crank. Now, this is actually cleaned up. The rough forgings were always a lot more than this, and sometimes they didn't even have edges on. But hey, you know, I've drawn a best case scenario. Anyway, when Tom first came out with his uh, 9000 series cast steel crank, it had these corners on it. So he asked me if I'd like to test some more advanced shapes. Well, here's the first one I did with nothing more than rounding off these edges, right? Now, as you can imagine it at low RPM, no difference whatsoever. But as the RPM climbed, so this started to show a difference and at about 7500 as near as i can remember this was about oh three to four horsepower better hey not much on a nominally 400 horsepower engine but it's horsepower you're saving we eventually got to a shape more like this and that there was at 7,000 RPM, now I remember this very well, at 7,000 RPM was worth 7 horsepower. So, there's an easy 7 horsepower to be had. Now you can't really see any of this until the RPM gets to about 4,000. But this shape, I was applying to cranks like this with a body grinder, right? So it can be done at home. A point I need to uh, raise with a leading edge this shape is that the mains web needs to come down this side so that you, you, the crank is pulling the oil into the mains web. If you do it the other way around it dumps all the oil into the path of the rapidly moving connecting rods and you can actually lose horsepower. Interesting point here I was looking at a BMW turbo Formula One crank and I noticed they'd chamfered it on the wrong side, right? So I'm not sure how that helped their uh, power any, but uh, I know those turbo motors had a lot of oil going around and they were pushing it all 
into the area of the rods, which by the way are going around at 10, 12 odd thousand RPM. I want you to take a look at the counterweights in this next picture. What you're looking for is a different pattern of counterweighting around the center main bearing. With the typical two-plane crank, the big end journals are disposed either side of the main bearing, center main bearing, at 180 degrees. So they tend to balance out. However, there is a secondary out of balance force here, or rather a couple, causing the throws of each one to move, try and move up and down uh, in a kind of oscillating way this way, crank going around that way. And uh, where is the light crank, that is the one without the counterweights, may be fine for drag racing. Typically, the one that's fully counterweight weighted, which has less of a couple from the uh, dis low, uh, disposition of the big ends there, is better for long distance racing. Now, all that said, that is not a hard and fast rule. I've built long distance engines with no counterweights on the center, and I've built them with counterweights. Now, although I've only got a theoretical preference here, I like to see the fully counterweighted cranks on engines such as offshore powerboats. But for all other purposes, non-counterweighted uh, center throws are just fine. Let's get back to the subject of crank journal finish, i.e. polishing the big end journal and main journal. Not so long ago, there was a company claiming that with their super micro polishing system, they picked up 20 horsepower uh, from reduced friction of the crankshaft. Well, let me tell you my thoughts on that. It's total BS. Let's think about this in real engineering terms. 20 horsepower is equivalent to 15,000 watts. Now, let's consider this. That would be the same as five three-bar electric fires. You know, the ones with the wound coils on? That they liberated from the crankshaft. Well, had the crank had that to be liberated, right then before it should have heated the oil to the point where it almost caught fire right so saving 15,000 watts from just friction due to polishing the crank is not believable now what evidence have I got to this other than the theoretically impracticality of gaining that much power simple Ages ago, and this was in the era of the 20,000 RPM F1 engine at Cosworth, I had a couple of my buddies there. Their job was testing crank finishes, right? They actually got, by the way, this is, a, they got that F1 engine to 21,000 RPM, so I heard, or about there. Now, we never saw it real life because the rules changed, and I think that that 21,000 RPM scared the FIA into limiting the RPM to 18,000. Anyway, they went from their regular polish, which was a good polish, but nothing that you can't get on a crank here if you buy a good crank. They went from that to a micro polished crank and on an F1 engine that was capable of turning 20,000 RPM, so it would have shown a difference had there been one, 
they saw nothing that they could certainly measure. So, don't believe those big numbers of polished cranks. If the crank has got a good polish, the only thing that you will see better is longer bearing life and the oil. Uh, you can, you'll be able to use thinner oil and that may give you a, a, the odd horsepower cell, but that's about it. Well, that brings us to the end of this part one of our crank um, investigation. In part two, I'm going to cover more on balancing than anything else, but I will talk a little bit about crank coatings, right? So now hopefully you've all found this to be helpful. So if that's the case, please subscribe, like, comment, and share. Oh, and of course, notify. Thank you very much for watching.